It's good to see you this morning. For you in the room, for those of you that are joining us online, it's awesome. Uh, and I am so honored and uh, excited to be with you here this morning at the Lord's table. It's, uh, it's another great day to remember, just like every day, how, how good God is. Amen? Amen? Come on, there's not a lot of you. You got to speak up, right? Like, got to be the got to be the rowdy crowd, even if you're not the rowdy crowd. Amen. God's good, right? There you go. Uh, hey, so I want to uh, I want to do something this morning that we do normally this time of year. Uh, we're doing it a little different this year because I kind of want to take you on a little uh, a little journey, so to speak, of remembrance but also to give you some inspiration because, you know, one of the beautiful things that I know to be true about the Lord is that, is that when we say He's out of time or not bound by time, it's interesting how God can be present now. He's in our future, in our past. In other words, He can even go back into our past presently and deal with those things. That's how we get healing. Um, but he's also uh, done so many things for us to remember. And so God not being bound by time, it's kind of funny to, 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 to focus on what he's done and think about what he's going to do because he's, he's in all of it. And I want to do this uh, this morning, uh, not in a sense of, of uh, remembering the good old days, but I think it's fair because some of you uh, are here that have been here for a very long time. Some of you are here. Um, that this may be your first time. You may be in the room. You may be joining us online. It's your very first time in this room, and you don't even really have an idea. Who are these people? What are they about? Where have they been? And I want to show you this morning uh, and take you on a little trip about where we've been because this year our church uh, has another birthday. Always, like the third week of September, we celebrate yet another anniversary, uh, and, and you all do the math. Yeah, it's good, right? Uh, 1998, the Lord's Table started, and because I'm bad at math, I'm not even going to try, right? You guys can figure it out, get your phones out, something like that, but uh, all I know is it was a long time ago. You know how I know that? Because I dug out some old, if you, this tells you how old, CDs of pictures of some of y'all, and it was a long time ago. That's all I'm saying, because some of y'all look tremendously different, uh, but I want to kind of start you out and just talk our way through it. You know, you look at this, you go, what is that? That is, I think, the Lord's Table's first logo, right? So we were pretty pretty pumped up, man. I think projectors cost about $4,400,000 last back then, you know, just to have a projector was cool. And we were all excited, you know, getting into a, getting together and having something like a logo just kind of put you, put you all under one, one kind of group. And, and it was fun. It was, it was good times. And, uh, and I thought, you know, why do we do these kind of things? Why take a Sunday when we could dig into God's Word and, and pull out all kinds of truth and let the Holy Spirit speak to us? Why go back? And i tell you why we go back, because the Scripture tells us to go back. So before we do, I'd love for you to join me in prayer, because even though we're going to talk about our history, where we are and where we're going a little bit this morning, I want you to know that God can speak to you in your moment, uh, even through things that are fun like this, all right? So let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would have absolute control in this room. God, that your voice would be the loudest voice in each one of our lives, God, that you would bless each and every person that's, that's a part of this, that hears this message. And Father, I just, I just lift up your name, God, because that's really what we're here to do, is to pray to you, to bless you, and to love you, and to love one another. And God, we intend to do that. So I just pray that you'll take the rest of our service, God, and use it for your glory, your purpose, and your plan. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so check this scripture out. I'm going to start our history out with a scripture, and it says this. It says, uh, but then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You're the God of great wonders, and you demonstrate your, your awesome power among the nations. Think about this. This is David writing a psalm, and he says, And I recall all that you've done, O Lord, and I remember all of your wonderful deeds of long ago. 
It's easy for us to say, hey, look, don't look into the past. You know, the past is the past. Leave it behind. But all through Scripture, you'll see you'll see people look back at the wondrous things that God has done in the lives of a people and of a person. And and it it draws this sense of awe as far as uh, what God's doing, because I'll tell you what, here's an interesting fact for you is that you can walk in the moment of the miraculous, and it seemed absolutely mundane. You can be walking right now, you can be walking out a miracle, and it just seems like another day. Because a lot of times, things don't quite look like they look until you look at them in the rearview mirror. And so, so for us, it's important to remember what God's done, where he's brought us from, and where he's brought us to, so that we can realize that he's always, always, always working. In our life, individually, in our life as a church, in the life of, of, of his purpose for the Big C Church, and his plan for mankind. He's always at work. And so sometimes our miracle doesn't look like one until we think back and say, wow, well, that's a wondrous thing God did. And I'm telling you just from my own personal experience, most of the time that I'm wowed, I'm wowed in the rearview mirror because wow doesn't feel too wow on that day. It just feels like I got up and did what God was telling me to do that day. A small act of, of obedience, a small act of obedience, and next thing you know, uh, my whole scenery's changed. My whole, my whole uh, dynamic has changed, and I see God's hand in all of it. And I can tell you that that's true of my life personally, but even, even so much so uh, for our church, the Lord's table. Amen? So I'll take you way back in case you didn't, uh, you didn't know. Uh, back in August of 1998, these two young cats right here got together, put their heads together, and decided uh, that one was, a, one was an amazing preacher and one was an amazing worship leader, and they uh, got together and decided all of a sudden that, uh, it, that they felt like God was putting them together for such a time as this and that we were going to, um, we were going to begin a church and so, uh, if you don't know who these people are, that is um, Mitch Ham on the left. You know him. And that is uh, Pastor Bill Wilson on the right. And he, I'll just go ahead and get it out of the way. He's the best pastor I ever had. Uh, an awesome friend. Many of you knew him. You can clap, clap because, uh, because here's the deal. I can say this honestly. If you knew him, you get it. If you didn't know him, you don't get it. I'm sorry you missed out. Uh, but there wasn't anybody on the planet more fun to laugh with, joke with, cry with, pray with, whatever it was. Just an amazing guy um, who, who had a heart and was just crazy enough to believe that something was possible like the Lord's table, right? So when I say this, I don't want to say that it was time to start another church because actually that was the point. It was time to start not just another church. It was time to begin a work where God was the focus, where people could love one another, and the scripture that we all know as Psalm 23 we'll get into later could be lived out on a daily basis with people that were white, black, Asian, didn't matter, Hispanic, whatever, whoever, if you love Jesus, there was a spot for you at the table. Amen? And that was the whole point, and we, we live in, that's good. We live in the presence and the manifestation of the sacrifice and the, and the work and the labor of love that people way back when poured into, all right? So in August 1998, these are just the facts, uh, it, it, it all started, the conversation started. You know, probably went something like this, hey, Suge, right? If you know Bill, that was his thing, hey, Suge, calling Mitch. And it went on. If you ever want to know the story, by the way, Mitch's first-hand account, right, uh, first-person witness, so he'll be glad to tell you that o- over some coffee or something sometime if you're curious. But uh, August and September, seven people got together for the very first meeting, the next meeting, 12, the next meeting, more and more, all the way up until the winter of 1998, where the church started, uh, the church really started, and they were in a... Uh, Ultimately, well, at first they were in a house because they got too big for a room, and then they got a little too big for the upstairs of a house, so they moved to the storefront that's right outside the main gate, uh, and and that was where I first attended the Lord's table uh, back in 99, Um, 
and then all of a sudden, uh, after I figured out where the church was, they up and moved. Uh, I should say we up and moved. In the summer of 2001, we moved onto a property, which is the one you see now. And uh, here's a picture of it. Pretty neat, right? Uh, if, 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 you, if you go, this just looks like our church, then I want you to notice some of the trees that block the building now are not even there, or they're very small. And there's a big building missing on the backside, which is what you're sitting in now. But it's important when we talk about the wondrous things that God does, right? We can't talk about this building without talking about one of the wondrous things that God did. Uh, you know, a church moves out of a storefront because they're outgrowing it. They need a space. This used to be a plant nursery called Sunshine Gardens, and it was owned by a man named Eddie Harrington, who at the time uh, was, had cancer, and he would eventually pass from that cancer. And the building was for sale, and basically, Pastor Bill, Pastor Mitch, get with Eddie Harrington's people. They start talking about it, and, and here's the challenge, right? You want to buy a building, you want to buy land, but you don't have any money or very little money. The question is, do you guys have savings? No. Do you have a capital campaign for your building? Do you have a building fund? Uh, no. Do you have any credit? Mm-mm, we're a year old. Okay, we'll give you the money. That's basically the gist of the story, right? Uh, the way Mitch tells it, uh, they went to Mr. Harrington, and on his uh, deathbed, he wanted this place to be a place of worship so bad that he sold it uh, at hundreds of thousand dollars less than he had a standing offer for because he wanted to make it into a place of worship. So a sacrificial gift starting the whole thing out from someone that didn't even go to church here. And then the bank, basically, they have to give a construction loan because you can't just come and, I guess you could meet in a plant nursery, but it's not ideal. They want to kind of retrofit the place. They go to the bank and it, it, it is as complicated as this is what we want to do. We don't have any money. We don't have any savings. We don't have this. Uh, the banker, basically the head banker at the bank, uh, as Mitch tells it, said, looks at his watch kind of, uh, kind of um, impatiently and says, I, I got a tennis match. You guys just, just get them what they need and walks out of the room. That, that's it, right? So you can call that uh, divine impatience. You can call it divine favor. But, it, but you have to call it something because it surely isn't the norm. And so uh, with that, you know, you begin to see, and I'll tell you this, and I want to parallel the church with your own personal life, and that is this. When you get in line with the call of God in your life, you will see God move things in ways that you, that you will be wowed at. It doesn't mean that it can't be explained. It doesn't mean that it's 100% miraculous, but it is. You can call it favor. You can call it providence. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But you can see where God will push things for you in the right direction, clear the path for you, help the mountains become a little less like a mountain, and provide you a way where, where you think there might not be any way. But here's what it requires of you and what it, what it required of uh, the leaders in the church at that time was that, was that they were willing to consider what if God answers our prayer? What if? Because they could have sat back and went, ah, oh, it just, just won't happen. Ah, oh, it just never, ever works out. It just isn't going to. And they didn't go to the bank, and they didn't find the guy who had a tennis game that was really important to him, more important than like $1.2 million, because he's just like, write him the check. I got a tennis game. But you have to ask. You have to, be, you have to be bold enough to believe that what God is putting in your heart, and I have to believe that what God's putting in my heart, might just be God's plan, and God might just get behind his plan and do some amazing, amazing things. Well, the Lord's table kind of started to grow up. We ended up with a new logo. Check that one out. Pretty cool. Oldie but a goodie. Some of y'all remember these. Some of y'all don't. Uh, this logo, the, the, kind of the funny thing that this logo reminds me of is that I met a handful of people when this logo was on our sign, they thought this was a winery. They were like, what? That's a church? I thought that was a wine company distributor or something. I was like, well, it does have a steeple. But anyway, you know, depends on how you look. But a bunch of people got together in a new facility with, a, with kind of a, a vigor for the things of God. 
And that's what I'll say about the Lord's table is that, that from the beginning when I came and from the beginning before I came, that, that there's been a focus on God's word. There's been a focus on approaching God in an authentic way. There's been a love for one another and an expectation that if we just follow God, that we'll get to where we want to go. And it's been refreshing all along the way. We've had kids ministry the whole time. I think about this. I look back at these, some of these old VBS photos. That's in a double wide trailer that used to sit out back. That was our children's space. And I think like I started looking, I'm like, man, all we had was some masking tape in an empty room. Now we got a play place, man, this beautiful facility for our kids. And it's, it's just inviting and all that stuff. But the beauty of it is, is that all along, kids have been a huge part of the Lord's table. We love our kids. We just can't can't get enough of them, so to speak. Love them. Ministering to people everywhere where they are. This is in the old sanctuary. I thought I'd show you guys this one. This is a, this is like our youth corner. You know how the youth sit up here now? It's funny because it was all the way over on the left before. And uh, oh no, this is just a bunch of people. Sorry. You, you, you see, I see some of y'all in there. You see yourselves. It's, it's cute. Um, but uh, but you know, just bunches of people, right? And then I took this other picture. This next one here is is the youth corner, all the way over on the left, you know. Um, I used to get yelled at when I was a youth pastor because the youth would get rowdy during service or something like that. And they didn't go to their parents, and I never understood why. They'd come to me and be like, your kids are acting up, you know. But that was before I had gray hair, you know, a bunch of people in there, pretty cool. And, uh, and, and I'm going to get to some stories here in a minute. I just kind of thought I'd pull up some old pics just for you guys to get your head wrapped around it because where our kids area is now that was our main sanctuary a little smaller than this about a fourth of the size but fantastic then a new logo I'm not really hung up on logos I just like looking through the old pictures of them, right and during this time we begin to see uh, how God's favor is on the church uh, through good times, uh, explosive growth, uh, you know, and all that comes with that, which is not always easy, uh, through uh, times of, of tremendous uh, um, tragedy. Uh, I could tell all those stories. I, I got a few I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really dig into, but, but doing life together, because as I thought back, I thought, you know, the common theme between whether it was awesome or whether it was terrible, that God has allowed us to be a people who just did all this together that loved one another through the tough times, celebrated with one, or, one another through the great times, and just constantly allowing God to use us in each other's lives, focused on Him, focused on all the things that God has for us. Amen? And it really kind of brought back a scripture to me that, that I want to share with you. It's in Psalm 9, I believe. I think that's right. Yeah, 9-1. It says, I will tell, or I'm sorry, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart, and I'll tell of all the marvelous things you have done. And I know you can probably look back in your life and you can say, I know the marvelous things God's done for me. I just try to remember them. I remember all that. I remember it as far as the church goes. Uh, it, because it's easy sometimes when you're just in the grind of your life or whether you're in the grind of a church's life, whatever, to just look at the struggles that you're in and the struggles that you have right now, and you forget to look back and say, my God, you've been so faithful all the way, all the way. The things I used to struggle with, I ain't struggling with that anymore. I, I had a mountain and you moved it. I had an impassable road and you cleared it. There was something that be, it was impossible and you made it possible. You did it. You did that, Lord. And so why would I doubt for one moment that you wouldn't do it for me now? Why would I doubt for a moment? And so whenever you look back, it forces you to acknowledge a couple of things. God's favor. We've seen God's faithfulness. God's provision. We've seen his blessing. We've seen him stand true to his word for decades. And when I think back of it, it just it gives me a sense of peace and a sense of sureness in him that increases every time I think about all that he's come through on. Amen? It doesn't mean there's not a disappointment here and there. That's okay. I don't have to always line up with it. I don't even have to always understand it. 
But if you put it all on the scales, the disappointments are very, very, very light. And the promises and the goodness comes through over and over and over. Amen? I want to share with you because I think a couple of these stories embody uh, some things that are, that are very, very near and dear to our church. If you look at this picture here, this is Pastor Bill Wilson uh, and this dude that I became friends with named Tony King. If you didn't know Tony, uh, I, want you, I want you to hear his story. Tony King was, uh, he was a rough old army first sergeant. Uh, Tony and my relationship was good because this man pulled no punches. Uh, he didn't even wait for me to ask one time in one of my earlier sermons. He didn't even ask for me, me to ask his opinion about what he thought. He said, hey, I want to offer you my opinion. I said, all right, Tony, what'd you think? And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to tell me. He said, that stunk. I said, what? He said, yeah, I ain't playing with you. That stunk. I'm like, well, I was suspecting it, but you're the only one that's actually told me, right? I knew it stunk. He knew it stunk. So why pull any punches, right? He said, man, you up there trying to act all academic and you didn't tell one story. Just, he said, if I want to read, a, if I just, I could read the Bible myself. That's all you did. I said, well, I, it's, hey, you can't go wrong, right? If you're early in preaching, just read scripture. You can't go wrong with that. And so we had this fun discussion back and forth. And you think, man, that guy's mean. He's not mean. He was just one of those guys that was just honest. And it was interesting. And the reason I tell you all this is because he had a, uh, a, hereditary blood disorder that destroyed his own kidneys. And as you look at this picture, this is early on when he found out that his kidneys were failing. Uh, he had been given a very grim prognosis. Uh, and Bill was letting the congregation know that this man was in need of a kidney transplant. And if you had an extra one laying around, Maybe you consider giving it to him. Some of y'all just looked at me like, are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. He laid it out there. This man needs a kidney. And, there, and the funny thing is, is Tony was tall. Man, help me out. Six, three, six, four. Big dude, man. Big dude. And this little old white lady had a kidney, probably about that big, gave him one of her kidneys. And it was a beautiful picture of the reconciliation that was happening all the while as people worshiped together from different ethnicities and stuff like that. And it, was, and it was later on that I had a conversation with Tony. Uh, eventually, his blood destroyed that kidney, but it gave him, it was several years. And then he continued to live. But I want to tell you a little bit about Tony because his story is amazing, right? Because you think, well, you're talking about him like he's not here. Well, he's not. He passed away. And, and you might say that's sad, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll contradict that a little bit because I watched God answer Tony's biggest prayer. And I'll tell you about that. He said to me, uh, he said, and he was on dialysis at the time. He and I were actually driving up to Duke because there was a young guy, he was about 13 years old, who was on dialysis and had a similar situation, wasn't going to have kidneys. And Tony said he wanted to go with me because I told him I was going to see this guy. Tony said, I want to go with you because I'm going to tell him that he'll be fine without his kidneys for a long time because Tony had been. So we rode up there and Tony comes in, like say six foot four, first sergeant, looks at him. He said, let me tell you something, young fella. Don't you give up. You don't need no kidney. They got their machine. They, you'll get one. And I'm like, I don't know if this sounds like hope or a butt chewing. I, ended, I couldn't tell, right? The, the guy said, yes, sir, yes, sir. You know, I guess I won't give up hope. But Tony lived his life that way, lived his life without giving up hope. And it was on that ride home that Tony told me that he said, you know, he said, uh, we were talking about everything. He, he, had, um, he had trouble with um, racism. And, and he said, and, and, and turn, first he had a problem with Christianity, and then he found the Lord's table and people that loved him. He got saved. Then he had a problem with racism, and then this white lady gives him a kid. It's like God kept throwing him these curveballs like, hey, everything you think, it, that might not be how it is. And, he, and he, he loved to walk through the things that, that God was challenging him with. And then he said, the one thing that I want is to watch my, uh, is to see my boys grow up. And he did. Before he passed away, his boys, they weren't old men by any means, but they made it. He got to watch them, at least through their adolescent years. And, uh, and his son, um, Anthony, you see oftentimes around here, he's, again, real tall, usually known by his hair. Uh, 
But he runs around here. He's faithfully volunteers in our nursery. He's a huge part. He's a, he's a young uh, or a youth small group leader, uh, has been in this church. You've been his family. And, and, and it's been amazing to see how God answered a man's prayer. And even though it didn't work out like we wanted it to, God honored what he asked for and kept him. I mean, the man lived with no kidneys for, I'm not, I'm not even sure, eight years, something like that, just on dialysis and never complained, never complained. He told me one time, I went in to see him, and we thought he wasn't going to make it. He was in the hospital. This was a Wednesday. He looked up at me, and he said, Pastor Ken. He didn't look at me. His eyes were closed. Now that I think about it, he said, I'm going to be in church on Sunday. And I'm like, okay. I pat him on the arm like, okay, Tony. And sure enough, that joker rolled right in here and sat right in that second row that, that Sunday. I said, man, there ain't no way, right? It's Lazarus stuff here. But why tell his story? I like his story because it reminds me and should remind you that no matter what you face, that God is faithful in that, and it might not be cookie cutter. You know, we would all say that if God didn't make him miraculously grow some kidneys, that, that it didn't happen. But I'll tell you, it did happen. I'll tell you that good things were in his life. I'll tell you that, that God honored his most heartfelt prayer. I'll tell you that God raised him up more times than he laid down. And I'll tell you this, that he inspired more people than, than I ha ever have. And it, he earned the title from me, which if you know me, then you know this ain't easy, still reigning champion, toughest man that's ever lived. Yeah? And it's good. Amen? It's good. And I think back on times like that, and you say, why pick that story, man? Because that's just one of hundreds, you know, maybe not as extreme as that. But how many people, you know, uh, and I, 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 I got to joke, I got to tell you this story, because I got to joke around about, with Tony about the, the sermon that stinks. I preached another one. I walked right off the stage. I said, well, that one stunk too. And he just chuckled. He didn't rebuke or refute it or anything. Didn't agree wholeheartedly, whatever. I, told, I said, well, Tony, there's another one. That one stunk. And he kind of chuckled, and he didn't get away from me when no sooner a guy walked up and, and started telling me about how he was going to kill himself at the end of the day, and now he wasn't. I didn't preach a message on suicide. Hope, maybe, love, I don't know. Perseverance, all the things that God teaches us, right? But you think like, man, and, and I told Tony, I said, well, for that guy it didn't stink, did it? I didn't like it. But for him... And it reminds me all the time when I think about that stuff and those conversations that, that God is always faithful whether you feel like it's working or not. God is faithful whether you, whether, you know, whether the soup smells good or not. It's all good, right? And you need to understand that as long as you're following God, as long as you're walking out his purpose, his plan for you, then, then God's in it. And all you got to do is hang around long enough to, to see today in the rearview mirror and you'll see that God was working in it every minute, every second. Amen? So then we fast forward. This is around the same time. You'll recognize the stage is a little bit different. But we had a day uh, where we talked about generations. Generations. And at the time, uh, my dad had recently gotten saved, started coming to the church. And, uh, and so I had me and my dad, my sons, three generations, and, and other people. There was a family there that day that had four generations. And you may recognize them. I had to put the dad with the son so you'd recognize the son. But many of you know that little fella right there as the Lord's Table youth pastor named Trey Woodard, right? Uh, and, I, and I saw this picture and I thought, oh my goodness, we've been around long enough now that we've seen our babies that are going to VBS and hanging out in middle school and doing all this stuff now be risen up and are pastors and leaders even in our own church. That's good stuff, ain't it? Hey, man, that's good that God raises up within a house the little kids, right? And what a joy. I'm not talking, I'm not saying he got, he's here because he was here. I'm saying that he's the cream of the crop, man, that, that, that a passion and a zeal for God has been in his life since he was a little fella. I got to be his kid's pastor and his youth pastor. That's how long I've been around, right? So, uh, so it's awesome to see that and to see how, how God honors faithfulness because one of the things we love and we always have loved is longevity, right? And the blessing of God, just staying here at the Lord's table. That, that's the thing that keeps us uh, true to God's word and not distracted and, 
and, and, and, and mindful of all the different things that God's laid before us. Amen? There used to be a scripture that set was, didn't set, it was uh, stenciled on the walls over there uh, when we were in that sanctuary. And I'm going to pull up just a little bit more than that, but, but it's from Psalm 23. It says, You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Some people say, hey, how do you get a name for your church like the Lord's Table, right? Uh, and, and it was for a couple reasons. One, uh, because we always wanted to remember whose table this was. It's never been about a person. It's always been about people. I'm going to bust out one of Bill's old lines for you. You'll like it. It's not big potatoes or little potatoes. It's mashed potatoes, right? So it's not about one person looking like all that and on all. It's, it's a matter that every single person in this room is gifted of God, valued of God, and you bring something to the table of value, and we, we're open for that, that, that it matters that you're here, that it's not some, uh, sh- you know, something about show, it's not something about, about a performance, but it's about pursuing a God that loves you because he pursued you first. It's about giving our lives to God because he gave his life for us first. And I look back at our rearview mirror, and I'm thinking, man, I could, you know, me and Mitch sat down just to come up with a couple dates, and in an hour, we didn't even get to the dates because we just started on a couple of the stories. And, and, And it would fill volumes, and it would blow your mind, and many of you have your story in here. And, and, and it doesn't mean that, that, that if you've been here a long time, that gives you more clout, because it doesn't. It, all it means is you've been here longer. You just know a little more of the story, because if you're here now, you're adding to the story. You're here for a purpose. You didn't stumble in off of chance by any means. And as you come, God needed you to be here because he needed something that comes with you to be added to the story. And that's the beauty of it. In Philippians, Paul writes to the Philippian church, and he says this. He said, I'm certain that God who created, who, I'm sorry, who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And I think about that, and I think, you know, what if Paul was writing to the people of the Lord's table? You know, Uh, would he say the same thing, Uh, that he's certain that God that began a good work in us, would he believe that he's going to continue that until it's finished on the day of Christ's return? How awesome is it to be a part of something like that? How awesome is it to be a part of something that where we, I firmly believe that God, and, and I could tell you this because there were several times that the church shouldn't have made it. Can I be honest with you about that? Just several times. Whether it was, uh, like Mitch and I talked about this, whether, whether it was we were just in the process of building this building and an earthquake happened in Japan and doubled the price of steel overnight. We were in trouble, right? <laughs> we had to figure some stuff out. Then Bill passed away. And, and, and statistically, a church that's founded on a charismatic leader that's a non-denominational independent church, normally that church will survive six months. It's about a 30% chance a church survives like that. And, I, and the reason I think, and, and it's not because I took over from him, it's because the way it was built, it was built about the people, not about the leader. That it was always built that together we're better. It was always built that God has a vision here, and we're all just in our roles seeing that vision fulfilled with humility, with integrity, and with charity. Those were the three, right? That we will, through these things, we will, we will stay before God, stay the course, and see exactly what it is he wants us to do. And, I, man, I'm, I'm thankful for our history. I am. I'm telling you that uh, some of y'all would have had a ball, and you, you can borrow them. I don't care. Uh, but I was digging through those CDs. Other than the fact that it takes an excruciating amount of time for a picture to load off of a CD, just so you know. Like, we're used to the click, man. It was, oh, oh my. Like, it was rough. But you look back through those things, and, and you see some faces, and you just laugh, and you think about some memories. But all the while, the thing that just overwhelmed me was the fact that, that in all of it, through each and every person who sacrificed, who gave, who prayed, who worshipped, who, who just became part of our family, 
those that have gone on before us and those that have just gone on, those of us who are here, it's amazing to be a part of the body of Christ and to be part of something where we know that God has smiled on it and, and, and shown us that, look, you don't have to panic about going under. You don't have to worry about going away because every time you should have, you didn't, and it was because my hand was there with you. So it's interesting, you know, we face... Uh, right now, we're, we're saying, what, what will our story look like in, in five or ten years? What, what, what's the church going to look like? We're in transitional, term, term, I don't even know how to say this, a lot of turmoil, right? All the things that we're wondering, will it ever get back to the way it was? Should it ever get back to the way it was? What are we going to do? That's okay. We don't have it all figured out, I'll tell you that. But here's what I know. The same God that saw us through the first time, the same God that saw us through the second time, the same God that, that caused Eddie Harrington to make uh, a sacrificial gift and make sure we had a place to worship, the same God that moved on the banker, the same God that got us a deal on everything that he got us a deal on, the same God that brought the provision then, the same God will bring the provision now. He'll move in hearts. He'll call us together, and we'll go on, and we'll see amazing things. What God wants to do in the future. So, you know, some people are like, well, what is it? He's about to tell us what we're going to do. I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you more about how you should feel about your future and the future of our church than you should uh, about anything else. Don't get lost in the details. Get lost in the, the thing that's nothing else. Get lost in Jesus. Get lost in his plan for you. Get lost in the fact that he'll see you through, even when it doesn't look like he's going to see you through. Get lost in the fact that it can look absolutely daunting out there. And remember that the one who's in you is greater than the one that's in the world. Remember that his plans for you are good. And remember everything he's done and, and just trust that he's just going to keep on coming through. We had me and Pastor Dwayne had a little joke this morning, and uh, we were singing that song, and I hope I don't mess this song up for you. If, you. if it does, then we'll just quit singing it, but that song, Nothing Else, it says, I'm not here for blessing. I looked at Dwayne, and I said, I am. I'm here for a blessing. I don't ever want Jesus to think that, because that, I'd be lying, right? I mean, I get it. I understand the heart of the song. I'm not always wanting something for you, Lord. I just want to hear you. I want to bless you. But, but, but the reason that I want a blessing from him is because his bank account is not short. God is not running low on the ability to do miracles. God's not running low on the ability, the resource, the provision, the desire to move you forward in your life. He's not. Every dream that he's putting in the hearts of his people, he has the resources to fulfill. Every ounce of everything that you and I may need to march heads up, optimistic, hopeful, and ready for our future is in Christ. Everything that we would want and need is in him. And so whether your future takes you a little bit this way or a little bit that way, whether our future at the Lord's table looks like our past or whether it looks like something new, I'm telling you that God has the ability to make it all happen. And we don't have to worry about it. Amen? And I thought, what a better message as we look back at our history and we celebrate another year. What a better message than to say that you can be optimistic about your future just like I'm optimistic about mine and of the Lord's table's future. Because I believe God put us here for a purpose, collectively and individually. And I know that as we come together and, and as we pursue God together, as we march forward into our future together, that that's going to be a good future. Even, even if it's challenging, it's going to be good. It's going to be good because God won't leave us, and it's going to be good because we're at each other's side as well that there's strength in the body, that you and I being purposeful to follow after the word of God and the call of God on our life is the one thing that can cause you and I to rise above all our circumstances. You don't have to get stressed about the news. You don't have to get stressed about whether TikTok's going away. You don't have to get stressed about any of that stuff. You can just focus and say, you know what? The God that was good to me yesterday, the God that's being good to me today is the God who will be good to me tomorrow. And he is without fail. And in him, all my days look 
quite bright ahead of myself. Mitch, would you come up here, man? Guys, it's not often because uh, we, like we said, we're not about celebrating. But y'all give this dude a hand. He was in on the beginning of this thing. He's been faithful in the whole thing. And he doesn't want your, want your praise and applause that much, which is why he's the perfect guy to be, at, to be at the very beginnings of a church that is always pointing to the Lord Jesus. Amen. And it's, uh, it's, been, it's, it's, it's been fun, and it's going to keep being fun. I want to just let you know that I want to talk a little bit more about this next week. I want to... We're going to have, hopefully, if, it, if, it, if all the travels work out, uh, one of our missionaries, Pastor Joseph Matua, is in town. And I just want to let you meet him because he just hadn't been able to get here that often. They've been building an amazing building over in Kenya, uh, and he's kind of been busy with that. But he's going to be here, not necessarily sharing the whole time, but, but I just want you to meet him. And I want you to know that it's such an honor to be part of a place that loves people across borders, across distance, across color, creed, it doesn't matter. You, you, not, I'm saying the Lord's table being us, the mashed potatoes, has a real gift of loving one another and loving other people. In fact, the only complaint that I've heard about y'all and I heard this from a friend of mine that said, uh, y'all are way too into loving people. He didn't like all the hugs he got. He said, I've been hugged more than a family reunion, is what he said. I said, well, so you just didn't know it, but you were at a family reunion. We have them every Sunday. And guys, it's an honor to be a part of God's work. And it's a pleasure to be a part of God's work here alongside you. And I'm looking in our, into our future and I'm thinking, Oh, my God, how bright it is because of the brightness of the one that's going before us. Amen. I'm excited to continue to build on God's story. And I hope that you get excited about your story as well. We have a great story here, and it's going to continue to be built. But remember that everything that's happening here is happening also in our individual lives as well. That God wants to build a story with you. My story goes uh, that, that for a long time in my life, I, re I refused to believe that God even existed. That was my story. That was my confession. But then, but then, then I received him as my Savior. I didn't know what that meant. And then, and then, and then. And I could just fill in the blanks with the end thens. I'm still doing some end, th end thens, right? Because God ain't finished with me yet. But the very beginning of it starts when you do what Pastor Dwayne said and you say yes to Jesus. When you say, you know what? I've tried to do it myself. I've tried to live with sin. I can't do it. I don't know what to do. I need someone to help me. That someone is Jesus. He's the... Nothing else we've been talking about. Nothing else will do it for you. Nothing else. No one else can forgive sin except for Jesus. The scripture says that no man comes to the Father except through him. So if you're here this morning, if you're joining us online, and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I would say this. Today, how about you open up and you begin the prologue of your story? With today, September 20th, 2020, I say yes. I say yes, I'll, I'll follow you, Jesus. Yes, I want you to be my Savior. If that's you, I want, to just pray, I want you to just pray this out loud with me, okay? Don't be shy or embarrassed, but just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me, for dying for me, for loving me when I was at my most unlovable. For forgiving my sin, for breathing new life into me, for giving me an eternity with you, 
and for filling me with your Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you. And I today proclaim you as my Lord, as my Savior, and my friend. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give those people a hand. Amen. That's good. Yep. I remember the day I said yes. And I remember what a beautiful journey that that began. Amen. What a great history. Pastor Charles is here. His wife, Miss Vivian. Pastor Charles is on staff here with us for, for a long time. Poured his heart into it. Amen. How many? 17. Man. And if you ever want to wonder that God can give you the desires of your heart, just pull up a chair next to Pastor Charles because he's got some amazing, amazing testimonies about God working in his life. And there's so many other of you guys. But whether, whether you've been here 20 years or now maybe 50 minutes, just remember the beauty of having a table prepared for you is that there's always an empty seat for you to come in, for you to get restored. Yeah, I think about it. If you were hungry, you could come to the table and get some good food. If, if you sat at the table long enough, you got some good food. And you got nourished and you got strengthened. And every now and then, once you get good and strong, good and fed, you know, it's fun. You just back up. Y'all ever been at those meals where there's too many people in the house and you just say, whoop, I'm done. You grab my seat. And I love the fact that every day we say, hey, here's my seat, you know. Come in, get to know the Lord. He's good. And I'm just humbled today, and I just could ramble on all day, but I won't. I want to close with a blessing over you, but never forget to look in your rear view and see the wonders that God has done. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, I pray, God, that you would bless your people. God, I, I, I just pray that they'll remember things that they've long forgotten that you've done for them in their life, God. Every door that you open, every door that you close. Every time you made it rain and every time you made the sunshine come out. God, all of those things that we sought you for, God, bring to our remembrance so that we know that no matter what our future looks like, it looks good because you promised to be in it. I pray, Father, that you walk with your people, be in their life, speak to them, God. Give them a joy, a peace, and a confidence that, that blows their mind as they go through their whole week. I just thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and everything that you brought to our lives even each other, putting us together that we might know one another here and in eternity. I just thank you for it. We bless your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week.